Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, why some groups say terms like master bedroom perpetuates racism. How does racial bias impact health care? Thousands of foreign students face the threat of deportation. A show honoring Native American women and warriors. And a Chicago farm that's growing flowers and jobs. But first, some of today's top stories. Governor J.B. Pritzker is calling on federal lawmakers to issue a nationwide mask mandate to help stem the spread of COVID-19. Pritzker testified this morning before the U.S. House Committee on Homeland Security about the national response to COVID-19. We need a national masking mandate. We instituted ours in Illinois on May 1st, one of the first in the nation, and it aligns with our most significant downward shifts in our infection rate. It's not too late for the federal government to make an impact. Pritzker used much of his time to once again criticize the Trump administration's pandemic response. He also urged Washington to help individual states make up revenue shortfalls from the past several months. And there's more on this story on our website. And Pritzker's comments come as the Illinois Department of Public Health reports 980 new coronavirus cases today, bringing that total number of confirmed cases to nearly 150,000. And an additional 36 deaths today for a total of 7,099 deaths. And even amidst the pandemic, the Taste of Chicago kicked off today, albeit with some significant changes because of COVID-19. The massive annual food festival has been rebranded Taste of Chicago to go. Instead of welcoming over a million people to Grant Park, the city is instead promoting partnerships with local restaurants and food trucks, as well as online activities. It will offer Chicagoans and food lovers across the globe five days of free online cooking demonstrations and virtual music and dance events, plus an expanded series of community eats meals provided by neighborhood restaurants and food trucks the Adapted Festival runs through Sunday, July 12th. And if the scorching summer heat has you wondering when you'll finally be able to officially hit the beach or pool in Chicago, the answer remains not yet. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is reiterating that she thinks reopening the city's public beaches and swimming pools right now would be unsafe and hamper efforts to stall the spread of COVID-19. Very difficult to enforce social distancing um, on a beach. We've seen that in other areas of the country that started and then closed down their beaches. We just think at this point, particularly given where we are in the arc of the virus, opening up beaches or swimming pools um, is a step too far. And as you may have seen, the restrictions haven't stopped many Chicagoans from jumping in the lake anyway. And we'll have more in our Spotlight Politics segment later in the program. And now we go to Carol Marine and why some groups are petitioning to change neighborhood nicknames and real estate listings. Carol. Paris, in the wake of George Floyd's killing, many Americans have been rethinking how the language we use each day may contribute to systemic racism. Washington's football team, Cleveland's baseball team, both are facing renewed pressure to change their names. Other calls for change are closer to home. So how can language contribute to discrimination or help combat it? Joining us to help talk about this, Devlin Camp, writer and host of the podcast, A Queer Serial. Courtney Jones, president of the Dearborn Realtist Board, a group of black real estate professionals in Chicago. And Annette D'Onofrio, a social linguist and assistant professor in Northwestern University's linguistics department. Welcome all of you. To Chicago tonight. Courtney, let me start with you. The Houston Association of Realtors at Properties and now your organization are doing away with the term master bedroom. Why is that significant? I mean, uh, I think uh, as you let into the segment, it's really all about language and, and, and how words resonate with folks. So with the history associated with that term, um, it's just the history we want to do away with. Devlin, you created a petition to change the name of the Lakeview neighborhood known as Boys Town. Why does that name need to be changed? I've worked in the neighborhood for years and uh, seen firsthand the way a lot of um, racism, transphobia 
have been and sexism have been perpetuated by things like the nickname Boys Town, which is not even legally the name. It's just a marketing tool, and uh, it's not inclusive of the many intersections of queer identity that live in and frequent that neighborhood. So, Annette, to you, there will be those who disagree with changing these names, calling it a kind of political correctness that's going to get in the way of seeing the bigger problems. Is that argument without all merit? Um, a lot of people will bring up this issue and say, you know, changing names is, is some form of kind of censorship. Um, but really, it's important to reflect on the fact that the names we use for things carry all kinds of meaning, not just the references that they're making, but all of the kind of social and historical meaning that come along with the reason we use those terms. Um, and so to Courtney and Devlin's point, um, these words and the way we use them, while you know many might not think about the implications that they bring with it, um, they do carry these kind of histories that can have um, a kind of problematic impact for a lot of members of these communities. I'm curious, Devlin, have you had an experience yourself with the way words were used kind of to weaponize a discussion with you? Oh, absolutely. I've had lesbian friends in bars told, why are you here? You're, you're, this is our neighborhood by gay men. Or I've seen transphobia from people coming into the neighborhood that don't really know where they are, that it is a queer neighborhood. And we have signs that are announcing that this neighborhood is for the boys. And people that come into our space should know that this is a place where we all have to live and exist together. There are trans women that have to come to the neighborhood for medical needs, and our families and friends are here. Courtney, I'm interested because your group is called Realtist, not Realtor, and that's a, a, a purposeful changing of the language. Why did you do that? Well, actually, um, I can't take credit for any of that. That's part of our long um, legacy history of being a democracy and housing organization and being about pushing for fair opportunity in housing and real estate for black Americans. Um, the organization was founded back in 1941, and that was all birthed out of a need to petition and fight for those issues that none of the other real estate trade associations saw a value in fighting. Annette, did your interest in linguistics stem from any use of language that you experienced that you wanted to change? Um, I'm really interested, the, the primary form of language that I study is the way that people communicate their identities and who they are through the way that they speak. Um, and I think kind of anyone that's interested in social interaction or in um, aspects of identity has thought about the way that the language other people use to classify us and also the language we use um, has a really important role to play. Um, so there are many ways in which language has been important to me. Um, and now I, I get to study it full time. So the Washington football team and the Cleveland baseball team are under pressure to change their names. The Chicago Blackhawks are as well, but they are saying that their name is a tribute to a specific historical figure, and in fact, there is some evidence for that. So sometimes is this a one-size-fits-all conversation that needs more nuance? Any of you on that? I can speak on that. Um, I think that one really important distinction that could be made in all of these areas that we've been talking about is the distinction between intent and impact. Um, so for the team names, for example, many people will say our intention is not to offend anyone. We are honoring um, a particular individual, a particular team. Um, and the question is really, what is the impact on people who are members of these communities um, that might feel differently about the way that the, the kind of name or the person um, is being used? So I think you know one way to start is to think about what are the reactions of members of oppressed groups to these kind of names. Um, and I agree that not every member of a group will have the exact same reaction, but I think that's an important place to start. Courtney, is it okay, or do you think that the Blackhawks need to change? No, I, I think she, I think I, I'm going to share the same sentiment that we just heard Annette speak from, which is, you know, the outcry is going to come from those that feel offended by it. And to me, when it comes to sports in general, you know, I'm a big diehard sports fan, but I do think we all need 
to be way more sensitive and cognitive around how what we say, call, and name things impact all folks. Devlin, there are going to be people, too, who feel that pretty soon they're going to be fearful of saying anything for fear of being judged by any of their words. Is there something to that argument? I think a lot of people can be a bit too defensive about looking inward at their own learned bigotry that they don't know that they have in their heart that they that maybe like Annette said about intention um if their intentions are good they might still be doing something racist or transphobic and and we all need to be open to discussing ways that we can change but also ways that we criticize each other when we see each other do, offending people that we need to know that many people are coming from a good place that they're just not educated on that particular subject matter. Uh, it, it should be a more open conversation. And that language has been evolving for centuries, decades, longer than all of that. And we saw in the feminist 70s, before that, in the Martin Luther King 60s, language changed as a result of, of those moments. Is this any different? Is this moment materially any different than those? It's really not, and this is such an important point that although we think language is this kind of crystallized thing and people are ruining it and, you know, it needs to be preserved, a feature of language is that it's constantly evolving and the way it evolves is that social change happens. So as people's concerns, as their priorities evolve, language evolves along with it. Um, so you mentioned the women's movement, for example, there were movements to change, say, um, the use of singular he to refer to um, any member of any gendered group, um, that changed. And I think there are changes that we're seeing even more recently with, say, um, singular pronoun they, for example. Um, so I think these are really good examples of kind of local social concerns um, that reflect kind of the way that language evolves socially um, in general. Thanks to all of you for this conversation. Courtney Jones, Devlin Camp, and Annette D'Onofrio. So thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight, and up next, Amanda Vinicky with a deeper look into which local organizations got federal stimulus relief. But first, a look at the weather. A partial release of Illinois companies that received loans from the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, has turned up big names, including some that are politically connected and may be familiar because of their connections to ethics scandals. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with new developments. Amanda, what have you learned? Well, Paris, lest anyone forget, before the coronavirus pandemic disrupted everything, Illinois and city governments were dealing with corrupt, with, pardon me, disruptions of an entirely different sort, and that is ethical corruption. And investigations that were sprawling, including the one that led to the indictment of former state Senator Martin Sandoval, the Democrat ended up pleading guilty to taking bribes in coordination with his then role as head of the state Senate's Transportation Committee. The search warrant that the feds used to raid his Capitol office gives some insight into what investigators were looking for, including information about Rick Heidner, Bold Rush Amusements Incorporated, Gold Rush Gaming, and any employees of those businesses. Heidner owns Gold Rush Gaming, which owns and operates video gaming consoles throughout Illinois. Heidner's PR team, since that warrant was made public, he and Gold Rush have been subject to what they say is inaccurate speculation in the media. And they've released a letter to WTTW to back that up, that assertion. The letter from the U.S. attorney says, in the context of a criminal investigation, a target is a person linked by substantial evidence to the commission of a crime and who is likely to be charged. It goes on to say that at this time, Heidner is not a target. Attorney Kalpazinski is not Heidner's attorney, but he has defended government officials. You definitely breathe a lot easier when you see the words non-target. Um, you know that you, you might be safe. 
The letter from the U.S. attorney finishes by saying that prosecutors have made no other representations or promises concerning their investigation, but Vizinski says a non-target should be in the clear. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, for real, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, I, you know, I just happened to be there. Um, but in fact, the government believes you were involved in it and you had knowledge. Uh, somebody who is a non-target and simply a witness is somebody that is a bystander. In a statement, Heidner spokespeople say that Heidner is confident that he and Gold Rush have acted properly and say he will continue to take, quote, appropriate action to restore his reputation. The state authority that regulates video gaming operations in Illinois has moved to revoke Gold Rush's state license. The Illinois Gaming Board said that it had no comment on this development, citing a policy to not comment on pending litigation. Gold Rush, like other video gaming operators, has been hurting these past few months when video gaming parlors were forced to close due to the governor's stay-at-home orders. The company did receive money from the federal PPP program as did another firm connected to the Sandoval investigation. That is Safe Speed, the Chicago-based red light camera company. Sandoval admitted to taking cash from a representative of Safe Speed in return for looking out for the company's interests in Springfield. Now, Safe Speed, through its attorney, said in an emailed statement that the PPP loan allowed it to bring 50 laid-off employees back to work. The loan is not newsworthy, the statement said. Safe Speed did nothing wrong. Rather, it appears that a former employee of Safe Speed was involved in illegal conduct. We immediately fired him when we found out. The Better Government Association's David Greising says there's nothing on the PPP form that asks whether applicants are parties or interests to ongoing investigations. The form merely asks whether the company has been found guilty of things like fraud. If you were merely a party of interest in an investigation, that question was not asked. And so uh, there's nothing that we know of that would indicate that they violated the rules of the loan program. Nevertheless, it, it's unfortunate that companies that maybe have been uh, skirting the edge of legal conduct would benefit from the government program. Pricing says it wouldn't be appropriate for the government to ask such speculative questions. If you believe in due process and the rule of law, I don't think you would want to create a system in which a person who is merely under scrutiny is not allowed to apply for and receive government support that the rest of us are eligible for. They are due their day in court. As a matter of disclosure, both WTTW's parent company and the BGA did receive payroll stimulus money. Another PPP applicant, House Speaker and Chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois, Michael Madigan. A spokeswoman for Madigan says his law firm did submit an application, but then withdrew it and received no money. Paris, back to you. Must have had a change of heart, Amanda. Thank you so much. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, looking at a new immigration order that threatens thousands of international students with deportation. Native Americans prepare to relaunch two museum shows in Chicago. It's time for us to get our kids back to school. The Trump administration ratchets up the pressure to reopen schools. Mayor Lightfoot's response and more in tonight's Spotlight Politics. A visit to the city's west side to check out a mural with a message. And the story of a farm that's growing flowers not in South America or California, but right here on Chicago's south and west sides. But first... Racism is a public health crisis. That was the message of an open letter signed by officials from three dozen Chicago area hospitals and clinics on Juneteenth. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people of color has made recent headlines, but racial disparities within health care have been studied and reported on long before the current pandemic. And joining us to offer their expertise and perspective are Dr. Monica Peake, an internist at the University of Chicago Medicine with a research focus on disparities in health care among African-American patients. Dr. Wendy Goodall McDonald, an obstetrician and gynecologist with Northwestern Medicine. She also runs the website DrEveryWoman.com. And Raul Garza, president and CEO of Aunt Martha's Health and Wellness, which provides community health care and child welfare services throughout Illinois. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. 
Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Peek, I'll start with you. Is racism a public health crisis and why? It absolutely is um, for several reasons, but I'll uh, just say that structural racism um, underlines almost all of the disparities that we see in health outcomes. And I think it's important for us to note that there's a, there are lots of different kinds of racism. Um, and what we're mainly talking about is not the interpersonal racism that we normally think about where someone doesn't like someone based on their social identity and has the power to act on it or the implicit bias, but we're mainly talking about structural inequities inside uh, in society, the policies and procedures, the way that our communities are set up that make certain uh, communities more disadvantaged. And those uh, disadvantages accumulate over time um, and result in horrible disparities in the health that we see. And, and those things are, um, our health crisis. And, we, and we've reported on that sort of structural inequity, but what about uh, inequities within the health care system, uh, Dr. Goodall McDonald? So I do think that implicit bias is something that we can't avoid. Of course, we think of overt racism, the things that we've seen on the TV and news recently, as, you know, apparent problems, crisis in this country. Um, on par with the COVID-19 pandemic. However, when a person walks into your office and you judge them based on simply what they look like or who they, you know, where they came from, you absolutely can be a person who treats that, that patient differently. And we don't talk about implicit bias enough, I think, in the healthcare setting, even in training, in medical school training, nursing school training, it's not something that comes up. And if we don't recognize those implicit biases, they can compound the socioeconomic biases that are, or effects of being poverty stricken or in places where you're not getting education that is adequate, those types of things. Okay, so Raul Garza, how about some specifics? How implicit bias might affect how uh, black and Latino patients might be treated? Well, I think it starts with uh, the, the leadership of healthcare systems. Um, in fact, several years ago, the American Hospital Association reported that over 91% of all hospital CEOs were white. Uh, it's not that different with uh, community health centers uh, where it's uh, disproportionately uh, white and uh, uh, are disproportionately uh, to, to a disadvantage to people of color. Um, when you look at historically the chronic illnesses with people of color uh, it outpaces uh, that compared to people of color and then you look at what's happened with the covid in the covid 19 environment where uh, over 50 percent of the people that test positive are people of color when they only represent about 31 percent of the total population in illinois so those are i think very strong statistics that go right at the issue you have to have diversity at the executive and leadership and management level of healthcare systems in order to really, I believe, get to the heart of disproportionality and care to those uh, uh, people of color. Dr. Peek, one of the things studied about in this field is perhaps healthcare providers don't understand cultural differences or preferences with different communities so well when they come in and seek treatment. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone has multiple social identities um, and different cultural backgrounds that they come from. And it's impossible for everyone to completely understand uh, the lived experience of someone else. But it is, um, it behooves all providers to try and uh, um, understand our own baggage, um, understand the limitations that we have in order to better connect with our patients um, and to um, best be able to provide care for them um, in order to have better outcomes. And in, uh, Dr. McDonald, we heard um, Raul Garza talk about uh, the need for more people of color, perhaps in leadership. I also read where um, doctors, medical providers themselves, there needs to be more uh, black and Latino uh, folks in those positions. Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. The matriculation into the healthcare fields of people of color, black and Latinx, is less than it was, if I'm not mistaken, about 20 years ago. Why do you um, think that we, is? I, I think there are there are educational pitfalls that we that are part of structural racism. Um, however, I think there's also a lack of representation, and I think that this that the the admission process needs to be examined because there are 
absolutely qualified um, African American Latinx uh, students who are applying for these for these um, positions. But part of it also goes back to who is in the admissions, you know, committee and who is actually um, evaluating these these people and what implicit biases do they bring to the table as well to be able to accept people into the healthcare fields and support them throughout. And Raul Garza, you know, we've talked about the severe disparities with COVID-19 and how it's impacted uh, Black and Latino communities. Uh, from your perspective as a community health care provider, how, how has that played out from what you've seen? Well, we were fortunate to be asked by the Centene Corporation, who is a uh, major uh, health insurance provider to the medically underserved and uh, unserved. And uh, the study that they asked us to participate in is a five-year study that began uh, about a month ago. And the purpose of the study is to assess the risk factors associated with the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on racial minorities in rural communities. Uh, our target uh, population is about 1,000 people to engage in this study. Uh, over the next month, we've already uh, engaged over 500 people. And what we've seen is that of the 60 people that have uh, tested positive, 80% of those are people of color. And that really aligns uh, in a similar way to what we're seeing happening in the state of Illinois. Um, this is a uh, study that'll be um, covered across five states in the country. And uh, we'll track those patients over that period of time to see how not just they're, they're affected by COVID-19, but how the healthcare system can support them with any uh, residual impact that they might experience as a result of uh, contracting the virus. All right, we're going to have to leave the conversation there. My thanks to Dr. Wendy Goodall McDonald, Dr. Monica Peek, and Raul Garza. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank, Thank you for having us. Hundreds of thousands of foreign students in the U.S. could be deported under a new federal immigration policy. This as the Trump administration urges all schools to open in the fall amid dramatically increasing cases of COVID-19. Under the new restrictions, foreign students enrolled only in online courses will not be granted visas. They'll be forced to leave or switch to another university offering in-person instruction. Joining us to discuss the impact are Neil McCrillis, Vice Provost for Global Engagement at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Lisa Freeman, President of Northern Illinois University. Thank you both for joining us. To be here, Paris. Thank you. All right, first Thank you. Uh, President Freeman, um, both of you had uh, planned on hybrid in-person and online schedules for the fall semester. I'll start with you, President Freeman. How has this order impacted those plans? We are working hard now to make sure that the international students who are such valuable members of our community will be able to have at least one non-online class so that they'll be able to remain at NIU and pursue their educations. And Mr. McCrillis, how about UIC? How has this affected plans for UIC? Yeah, with uh, thank you, Paris. With 4,000 international students, obviously we wanna make sure that they remain a part of our extremely diverse uh, community at UIC. So uh, for the last 48 hours since this uh, announcement came out, uh, we have been working very, very hard to, to find a number of different strategies, actually working with colleges, um, 16 colleges at UIC, working with them to come up with strategies both to ensure that we have sufficient in-person classes and also, <clears throat> excuse me, also blended or hybrid classes, which have a significant portion of in-person contact on campus so we can be in compliance, so we can continue to support the students and they can make progress towards the degree. So it's they chose us. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said they chose us, they want to continue, they've invested in us and we want to invest in them and support them. So it sounds like both of you are finding workarounds in this new order to make sure international students can stay here. Uh, President Freeman, what are you hearing from international students uh, that have been impacted by this in the last couple of days? Our students are devastated and they're terrified. They came to the US to take advantage of our great system of higher education. They left their families. They were in many cases unable to go home for the summer. The jobs that they were promised have evaporated and still they persevered. And the news yesterday, the abrupt announcement, the tone of it has them reeling. And uh, at UIC, uh Neil McCrillis, you mentioned the 4,000 international students you have there. Can you just give us a sense 
of the impact on their lives and on UIC? As you can imagine, um, all parts of campus, the deans, the faculty, the provost, the chancellor, me, my office, we're getting just dozens and dozens of emails, inquiries. It's the anxiety and the stress, I would say the totally unnecessary anxiety and stress that's being put on these students who've already gone through a tremendously difficult period, often, as President Freeman said, separated from their families for a long period of time during a, a pandemic. Uh, to put them through this, and you, you mentioned that we're finding workarounds, but this is a huge task because we've spent three months developing a very complex system of classes, combination of different kinds of uh, modalities, so that we would provide the best quality and the safest experience for our students. We spent three months doing that and finished, and now we're being asked, essentially being forced to revamp that. So it's, it's thrown long-held plans in limbo. Uh, President Freeman, you know, the Trump administration cited, quote, extraordinary circumstances as the need, as a reason for the need for this order. Do you see any public health imperative that students might need to be deported? You know, I think the public health risks associated with this order are unacceptable, both from the standpoint of individual international students who may be forced to put themselves in situations that are uncomfortable or risky because of pre-existing conditions just to be able to stay in the country to pursue their education. But also, if we were to see a resurgence of the virus in Illinois and move back from phase four to phase three of Restore Illinois, we would make the decision to go 100% online for the safety of our community. And at that point, to expect our students to be deported or to try to transfer mid-semester, to think about under those circumstances, students getting on planes, flying to countries where the borders might not be open, it's unworkable and it's dangerous. And certainly if there is a second wave, moving back to phase three is not all that unlikely. Uh, Neil McCrillis, talk about the fact that international students pay higher tuition rates and what the financial impact on UIC would be if you would have to lose a lot of those students. Well, um, of course, it's, they're a very significant portion of our, our population. And I would say not only do they pay those tuition rates, but they are among the best and the brightest. They're the ones we really want on campus along with our other students. They make up that diverse community that is UIC. Rather than talking about the, the revenues for UIC, I think it's important for folks to have an understanding of the impact on the Illinois economy. I mean, it's $2 billion worth of revenue that comes into the state through those students, the tuition they pay, the rent they pay, the groceries they buy, the services they uh, contract with. So that's a huge export industry in effect for Illinois. And to, to jeopardize that $2 billion uh, revenue for the state for no clear reason as far as we can see, and certainly no pub public health uh, hazard, it really makes no sense. So it's not just an institutional uh, risk or damage, it's really a statewide uh, potential economic damage. And President Freeman, there are statistics that show even nationwide that the uh, economic impact is $41 billion. So more on the, the economic benefits uh, of having your full slate of international students at NIU. You know, I'd rather actually talk about the cultural and intellectual benefits of having those students at NIU. We are uh, a peri-urban town. Our international students bring tremendous amount of global citizenry perspective to not only our campus, but to the surrounding community. We all benefit from what they bring and share and contribute, and that loss is unthinkable. And I've heard as much from members of our community as I've, ha as I've heard from faculty, staff, and other students about the need to make sure the students can stay here and thrive and that we all benefit from and, them. And so, Neil McCrillis, both of you, again, have talked about uh, ways that you want to ensure that these students will be able to stay. Do you think with the remaining weeks we have before the fall semester, uh, your institution will be successful at, at making sure those students will be able to stay here? Uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a, a real lift, but we're we're going to do it because we need to take care of these students. They've invested in us. They've committed to us, to, committed to us, and we have to ensure that they are provided with the quality education and the safety and, and good health that every student deserves when they come to UIC. So we've got to make it happen. We're going to make it happen.
And my thanks to Neil McCrillis and Lisa Freeman. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Back in March, the day after Mayor Lightfoot canceled the St. Patrick's Day Parade, another parade went on for the opening of twin exhib exhibitions about Native American people. A celebration took place on the University of Chicago's campus. The shows opened and then closed one day later. Arts producer Mark Vitale has the story. People on horseback, dancers, and elders gathered in the main quadrangle of the university. They were celebrating the launch of a pair of exhibitions, one at the university's Neubauer Collegium and the other at the Field Museum. Both honor the Apsalica people. Apsalica means children of the large beaked bird. In English, they became known as the crow and the once nomadic people became reservation bound in Montana. It's the first time a show at the field was curated by a Native American. We spoke with the curator from her home in New Mexico. What I'd like for people to do is to just sort of investigate a little bit deeper. Just really expand your idea of who we are in this country. And, you know, I think it's just sort of trying to help people also reimagine the way that they see their own creation stories, their own existence. The exhibit shines light on sacred shields and objects from Apsalica history, and also fashion, beadwork, and paintings made by contemporary artists. Everybody contributed. It was just sort of heart and mind and soul. Everybody was really just fully invested. The museum is in the middle of a three-year renovation of its native North American hall. We were really trying to understand how would a natural history museum today you know, think about issues around Native American art, around Native American collections. How can we steward those in a more respectful way that acknowledges the injury that museums had done to Native peoples from their very founding? You know, we don't educate people in this country about Native Americans very well. And most of the time, our audiences think that Native Americans are gone from the landscape. And so what I hope is that there will be a realization that Native peoples are still thriving, that Native American art is flourishing, and that there's a relationship between the past, the present, and the future. The show is titled Apsalica, Women and Warriors, and it looks at the variable definitions of each. For many sort of matriarchal indigenous communities, it's understood that the universe or nature sort of develops beings or plant life, animals that can sort of contain multiple genders or sort of sexual ways of being. We essentially just understand that there are people who don't fit into these sort of binaries. We had women who lived as men and took wives. We have women who never got involved with anybody and essentially lived their lives out as warriors. Opening day seems like long ago, but the curator is confident the reopening will come soon. Once it opens again, it'll be another celebration. I think the very fact that those shields and those objects exist in that space, it will absolutely open because they are supposed to be seen. They've come across these hundreds of years to sort of come to rise to the surface of the Field Museum and um, their songs will be sung again. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The Field Museum tells us that later this week they hope to announce a date for reopening. They also told us that no one got sick at the parade back in March when social distancing was less common. And you can see more from Women and Warriors on our website. With a deadly rise in violence, we're taking a closer look right now at the city's response, the political battle over schools reopening, and Senator Tammy Duckworth's apparently rising chances to be Joe Biden's vice presidential pick. Here to talk about all of that and more in the political intrigue arena is our spotlight politics team of Carol Marine, Amanda Vinicky, and Heather Sharon. Good to see all of you. And you, Perry. Okay, thank you. See, I needed that <laughs> feedback. All right. Carol, uh, let's start our conversation tonight with Police Superintendent David Brown, who is announcing a new citywide violent crime unit after three consecutive weekends with at least 65 people shot and multiple children killed. Here's what he had to say.
We cannot allow this to be normalized in this city. We cannot get used to hearing about children being gunned down in Chicago every weekend. Carol, these roving CPD units have been used before. They were called the Mobile Strike Force, I think, under for former Superintendent Jody Weiss. Then they were disbanded. Uh, critics said they didn't work. Any in indication that this will be different? You know, they go back even further than that, Paris. I mean, there was a 67 task force. Each superintendent tries to create a reorganization that he thinks is going to make a difference and confront Chicago's problems. The problems with some of these st strike forces have been in 67, the task force fell apart partially because it wasn't well enough supervised citywide. Fast forward to 2006 in a story I covered a lot, the Special Operations Section or SOS. Mm. It was brought down by horrific corruption and mismanagement and a lack of supervision. And so these are elite groups. Sometimes the officers on them begin to feel they are a little too elite and not quite answerable. So they can be genuine problems despite the promises. And Superintendent David Brown in an interview acknowledged sort of the fraught history of these groups. Carol, he's also going after prosecutors in the courts saying that the rise in violent crime could be tied to people not being held in jail. Is there any evidence linking those two things? Well, he was asked at that press conference to kind of put some meat on the bones of that claim, but has not yet done so in any sort of broad way. And this is not a new issue. I, I can't count the number of top cops who've argued the courts aren't doing their job, the prosecutors are too lenient. Um, these are far more complicated issues, as even Superintendent Brown would admit. And, and so it isn't a new claim, and I don't know that it leads to a substantially different outcome. Heather Sharon, let's move on to a far less complicated issue. Lake Michigan beaches, why isn't Mayor Lightfoot opening them? Well, she said this week that the risk of people flocking to the beaches and congregating and spreading the coronavirus is just too great. Now, she's come in for a lot of criticism because at the same time, she allowed indoor dining to reopen as well as bars. And people are saying, hey, if we are being allowed to go inside at a bar, why can't we go to a beach outside? And she says it's just too much of a risk that we would give up the progress that Chicago has made in reducing the spread of the coronavirus. Although there are social distancing agents out there that are supposed to be acting as sort of the the police uh, keeping people apart. Uh, Amanda Vinicky, the mayor, also announced this quarantine order for people coming from high COVID states. She did this via tweet and press release late on Friday. You know, most uh, places that have done this, uh, it was the governor that did this. Is there any evidence of a rift between the governor and the mayor as to why she's doing this? but the governor hasn't announced this statewide? I think that there are a, a couple of issues there. Number one, Chicago, as you'll hear from people throughout the state, is in a very different sort of situation than is the rest of Illinois. We really are more of a the hotbed of coronavirus versus, for example, just last week, there was a county, Scott County, that became the 102nd of Illinois, so the final of Illinois' 102 counties to actually see a case of COVID-19. So there's that. I do think, however, that it was uh, strange in terms of the timing, given that the mayor had just had a press conference with reporters who would have ostensibly had a lot of questions to ask on behalf of their viewers, readers, and listeners about what this quarantine meant, why it was being put in place, and it wasn't brought up at all then. And then instead of tweet, it's sort of reminiscent of also the curfew order issued via tweet. And I think that is something that certainly raises people's eyebrows and ire. A lot of questions also around whether schools are going to be open for in-person learning in the fall. President Trump and his administration, they're ratcheting up the pressure for schools to reopen. Here's what he had to say. And then Mayor Lightfoot's response. I think it's going to be good for them politically, so they keep the schools closed. No way. So we're very much going to put pressure on uh, governors and everybody else to open the schools. I think that this really has to be a localized decision. Um, candidly, I don't put a much weight into what President Trump says, particularly given um, his lack of leadership 
um, over the course of this pandemic. Heather, will this be a localized decision here at CPS and other school districts around the country? So it will be the governor's decision, and we've seen the governor's plans to allow in-person schooling with very strict limitations on the number of students per classroom, as well as masks and hand hygiene and all sorts of new rules that students will have to get used to. What we haven't seen is the specific plans for the Chicago public schools and whether they will have to sort of go to sort of a hybrid schedule with some days of students in the classroom and then and other days for remote learning because let's not forget that there are a lot of Chicago schools that have classes of up to 40 students in very small classrooms without a lot of extra space to move kids to so if you're going to maintain those social distancing limits you're going to have to come up with some new plans and we just don't know at this point what those plans are and a lot of parents are on pins and needles about that um, Chicago students aren't supposed to go back to school until after Labor Day so there are is a little bit more time in the suburbs. However, students will go back to school in about a month um, and those plans still by and large haven't been released. So it's a work in progress. I feel like politics will inject itself into this or that already has. There's a teachers union, there are public officials. We'll see how it plays out. Also this week, Senator Tammy Duckworth was the subject of personal attacks from President Trump and Fox TV host Tucker Carlson. But Duckworth, a veteran with a purple heart, had pointed words for Carlson to the president. Here's what she had to say over the weekend. He spent more time uh, worried about uh, honoring dead Confederates than he did talking about the lives of our America, the 130,000 Americans who lost their lives to COVID-19. So Carol, this led to some pretty harsh personal attacks from President Trump and one of his surrogates, uh, Tucker Carlson, the Fox host. Um, is, uh, is this sort of like preemptive strikes to see how a potential VP candidate would handle it? You know, um, I think yes and no. I mean, what you're hearing is the vitriol of the coming campaign. And I don't think it matters if it was Tammy Duckworth or Kamala Harris, if she looks like she is going to be the one. There are going to be these attacks in our polarized climate. And it's not as unusual as, as we might think. Tammy Duckworth comported herself pretty well on that, saying she thinks that uh, Tucker Carlson should walk a mile in her legs, um, an allusion to the fact that she lost them uh, as a warrior for this country. So if you're running for vice president or you think you are, you're going to be tested every way from Sunday, and so she will be as well. All right, Amanda, I want to move on to one final topic. Uh, even though there's no gubernatorial election for a long time, you, you see the airwaves inundated with ads about Governor Pritzker, his performance pro and con. What's behind all this? What's behind that? I think even though they don't directly say it, it could be tying the governor to the graduated income tax question that is going to be on the ballot in November. It is a key signature program of Governor Pritzker. By the way, he just put more than $50 million into a campaign to promote that change. So while it's named, it is tying him to that. And I think in general, just also sort of, um, we don't have a particularly active Republican party in Illinois these days. Democrats control everything. This is business interests sort of trying to perhaps sully the governor for that reason, looking ahead also to their own interests in November's election. All right, you can read more about these stories and a host of other ones on our website. And there you'll also find additional details on Chicago beaches remaining closed to the public. That's all at WTTW.com slash news. My thanks to all of our wonderful spotlight contributors. And from the protests in response to racial injustices to adjusting to our new normal as we continue in phase four of reopening, mental health remains a very pressing concern. In the spring, arts correspondent Angel Ito met with an artist who is sharing a mural with a message he hopes will uplift the community in more ways than one. Here's another look. You deserve to be happy. This is a message muralist Myron Laban believes people really need in the midst of current uncertainties. Some people who, they're not necessarily in a place where they experience joy, or maybe people forget what joy or happiness feels like, and this is just a, like a gentle reminder that, hey, you do deserve to be happy. 
and this is something that you're worthy of. Mental health awareness is at the forefront of every story LeBron tells. Known for his uplift character, his newest mural on the city's west side promotes the same message. The main character is the guy on the shoulders. Character is just basically my mantra on life. It's just a reminder just to keep moving forward. And, and even if things are hard, you have to keep an optimistic outlook and always know that things are gonna get better and, and have that sense of light at the end of the tunnel. It's the same reminder that Laban wants people to remember as the stress and anxiety the pandemic has brought begins to take a toll on mental health. He says he sees art not only as a way to help people, but as a way to heal. Everybody has mental health and everybody goes through it in some sort of way. And we all go through bouts of depression and anxiety and life, right? And someone, things happen and you know we have to respond to them and ways we respond are with our mental health. And through my own personal obstacles, you know, art has always been a tool to help me get through it. Now, Laban not only creates murals that promote mental health awareness, but he also uses his platform to encourage people to seek help if they feel they need it. I do have my Uplift campaign, and uh, there's a tab on my site called the Uplift campaign, and if you click it, you put your name and address, I send you an uplift print, and on the print, there's uh, free mental health resources. Laban deems his work as an artist to be essential now more than ever, because he believes art will not only help people process what they're feeling, but also provides a great way for people to simply let out their feelings. I think it's critical right now to express yourself, especially when you feel like you're isolated, you feel like you're locked in, and sometimes people feel like they don't have many things to do. And ways that you can express yourself and, and get your emotions out is through art. And it doesn't have to be painting, it could be through playing your piano, playing your ukulele, um, writing a poem. And art is just a productive way to let whatever you're going through out. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. Laban says he's gotten a lot of great response from the public, and since we last visited him, he's created another mural at Roosevelt and Mozart at an apartment complex. His next mural will be at Lawrence and Cicero, and he says he'll keep creating as long as people reach out. We've got Laban's list of resources on our website, as well as some suggestions for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on how to deal with mental health during this pandemic. And up next, how a Chicago farm is growing flowers and jobs on the city's south and west sides. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Do you know where the flowers in your bouquets come from? For the most part, it's Colombia or Ecuador, and in the U.S., California growers dominate the field. But on Chicago's south and west sides, there's a farm doing the same exact thing. And joining us to tell us more about Eco House is WTTW news reporter Patty Wetley. Patty, great to see you as Hi. always. All right, Hi, so we've, we've heard of uh, farm to table. Uh, Eco House is doing farm to vase. Explain what that is. <laughs> Yeah, it's a movement, it's called the Slow Flowers Movement, and it's doing for the flower industry, you know, what Farm to Table did for agriculture. So it's basically taking flowers, instead of it being this sort of global industry that's not remotely eco-friendly because you're transporting things across countries on refrigerated airplanes, um, you're growing flowers locally and seasonally. So we have Eco House on the south and west side taking vacant, otherwise vacant lots, turning it into productive land and growing flowers. And, and tell me more about what Eco House does and what its mission is. Yeah, it's a fantastic mission. They're doing more than just growing flowers locally. They're also growing jobs. So Eco House is actually a nonprofit and it uses the funds that it gets from selling all of these flowers for workforce development and job training programs. So the people who are harvesting the flowers and planting the bulbs and packaging up bouquets, those are youth age 16 to 24 or 25-ish 
from the neighborhood who are learning skills. Maybe they'll become uh, a, a florist themselves or a flower farmer of the future, but most importantly, they're getting work um, experience and, and that's what Eco House is all about. So every bouquet that you purchase or subscription to an Eco House CSA is not just, you know, this beautiful thing that you're kind of gifting yourself, but you're also creating jobs. So it's a budding organization there on the <laughs> south side. All right, Patty, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Paris. And you can read Patty's full story on our website where you'll find more information about the Farm to Vaz movement and Eco House's job training program. That's all at WTTW.com news. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Why Chicago is seeing a sustained spike in poor air quality this month and how one woman's quilting project brought women together from all over the country. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Please stay healthy and safe and we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.